In 2013, when SNF was looking for ways to address crippling youth unemployment, reaching an astonishing 60% as part of its major, the Foundation decided to build on the existing strength of the sector. Through the dire depths of Greek's severe, severe and prolonged socioeconomic crisis, agriculture has been a persistent bright spot in the Greek economy. New Agriculture for a New Generation is a partnership between the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences at Rutgers University, the American Farm School of Thessaloniki, and the American University of Athens. The program aims to give more than 2,000 young people the training they need to build successful careers in agriculture. New Agriculture for a New Generation is working to plant the seeds of an economic resurgence in Greece. We greatly anticipate seeing what grows. Το πρόγραμμα Μια Νέα Γεωργία για Μια Νέα Γενιά υποστηρίζεται από το Ίδρυμα Σταύρο Νιάρχο ε, ω μέρο τη πρωτοβουλία επανεκκίνηση των νέων. Αποφασίσαμε το 2015 με μια πρώτη δωρεά 2,1 εκατομμυρίων δολαρίων προ το Πανεπιστήμιο Ράτκερ να μελετήσουμε του ε, τομεί του αγροδιατροφικού τομέα, στου οποίου θα μπορούσε η Ελλάδα να έχει ένα συγκριτικό πλεονέκτημα και ένα περιθώριο ανάπτυξη. The Foundation had decided in 2013 to make a major commitment in this area. When we met them, they had already decided that agriculture and food was going to be a major pillar, one of three, in recharging the youth. Το επόμενο βήμα ήταν μια ακόμα μεγαλύτερη δωρεά, 27,4 εκατομμυρίων δολαρίων, με σκοπό να ενισχύσουμε συνολικά τον χώρο. The primary goal of the program is to reduce youth unemployment in Greece using agriculture and food systems infrastructures as a vehicle. Οι τρεις άξονες του έργου αφορούν την εκπαίδευση και εξειδίκευση των νέων ανθρώπων, τη δημιουργία και λειτουργία ενός εκτεταμένου τοπικού δικτύου συμβουλευτικής υποστήριξης και δημιουργία θερμοκοιτίδων αγροτικών πρακτικών και αγροδιατροφικής επιχειρηματικότητας. Αυτό που εμείς πρέπει να κάνουμε για να βοηθήσουμε πραγματικά τους νέους που θα ασχοληθούν με τον κλάδο είναι να κάνουν προϊόντα υψηλής προστιθέμενης αξίας και συγχρόνως φιλικά προς το περιβάλλον. Για την υλοποίηση αυτού του προγράμματος, πάνω από 100 άνθρωποι του Γεωπονικού Πανεπιστημίου σε όλα τα επίπεδα μπαίνουν στη λογική να υποστηρίζουν με τη γνώση τους το νέο αγρότη. Το σύνθημά μας είναι κανένα ταλέντο να μην πάει χαμένο. As part of the Recharging the Youth Initiative, SNF supports artworks which aims to provide financial aid to Greek artists aged 25 to 35 and encourage their professional development. We would like to invite all of you to visit the exhibition still here tomorrow, curated by Artworks and featuring the first cohort of the SNF Artworks Fellows, 45 visual artists and 15 filmmakers, taking place during the Summer Nostos Festival at the building of the National Library of Greece.
the lack of hiring by the private sector, conventional job skill initiatives have failed to help address staggering youth unemployment levels during the Greek socioeconomic crisis. Oral history and new initiatives supported by SNF will provide employment for thousands of young Greek, training them to arrange and collect oral testimonies throughout the country. Catherine Fleming, Provost of the New York University, will now elaborate more on this exciting initiative. Catherine, could you? Thank you very much. Ours is breaking news, so we don't have a video on the screen yet. We heard this morning about the importance of shedding light on the stories of others, and we heard Professor Edelman refer to the fact that we don't think enough about the ear and spend instead too much time thinking about the voice. My partner, Sofia Papayuanu, a well-known Greek journalist, and I are thrilled to have the support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for a huge new project that we're undertaking that will set out to collect the stories of thousands and tens of thousands of Greeks across the country by putting recorders in the hands of over a thousand unemployed Greek youth who we hope will better connect to their own pasts and to their own communities by sitting down for the simple act of conversation. Conversation with people with whom they live, with their families, with their friends. Conversations that we hope over time will build the most significant oral history archive in Greece to date. Thank you very much for being here to hear about the announcement. We hope our name will soon be known throughout Greece, but I won't tell it to you yet. Thank you very much to the Foundation for your support. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's such a great thrill uh, for me to, to moderate this session on uh, humans and nature. Uh, my name is Tash Ao. I'm a novelist from Malaysia, and part of my most of my job is in, is about listening to stories and about thinking about how we as humans receive stories and narratives about the world. And it seems to me that one of the most pressing stories in the world today is about man's, humankind's relationship with nature. And the received narrative today is a slightly apocalyptic one. It's about, it's, it's, it involves a lot of doom and gloom. Today we have two radical thinkers and experts in their fields. Um, and I'd really, we don't have very much time. I'd like to invite them to speak about uh, their work and about how they feel their work offers a radical solution to the future of uh, humanity's relationship with the natural world pure. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, well, I would start with a reflection about the title of our um, conversation, which is uh, Nature and Humanity, or Humanity and Nature. And I, would, I wonder if uh, we should not rephrase it as uh, humanity but nature. And I will uh, explain this further. Um, I j just have an example. This morning, uh, Sunita told us that a nine-month child has been raped and murdered in their own town, you know. And I was shocked by that. Uh, the manifestation of, your, of our affinity was that later on, when she said something that according to many of us was interesting, we made an applause. So are we, 
we, we consider human, we human are part of nature, but when we become so horrible and so, uh, so aggressive with each other, are we still part of nature? So this is my first question that we will maybe explore further. And the other one is nature in reality isn't, is uh, the place where we learn, but sometimes we call it mother nature. But mother nature, when it's uh, expressing its power, doesn't give a damn about, you know, in a hurricane, if people will die or, or, or will survive. So, so that idea that I heard this morning from someone, that there is still, we are in the Darwinian evolution mode, I, 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 I totally context that. We are in a human driven evolution so much that we have, are able to change the, the, the rhythm of water, of air, of flora and fauna. So we are now in this new area that we call Anthropocene age, from Anthropos, the Greek. And I, I would stop here, I want to hear Fio. But my name is Pio, and his name is Fio, so it's quite interesting. Pio and Fio. You can't make this up. Uh, so, um, thank you, thank you, Pio, for, uh, for starting off and contextualizing this with the most difficult context possible. Um, so, I guess I, w I want to tie in to some of the things that were said this morning. I thought, uh, uh, I thought that the director of the Lincoln Center uh, was showing very much, very much a division between old and new, um, and, uh, and sort of like the bottom-up and the top-down approaches that, you know, society, uh, governance, social, uh, social settings do have, uh, do have today. And I think that a lot of what drives me is how you connect the two and how you stay in the middle. To me, the interface is very important. I think that in response to, to the, you know, to the era, to the era of our connection as humans with nature, I think, uh, I think we, uh, I think my hope is that we go towards, towards a, uh, sort of, um, connected Anthropocene, for lack of a better, uh, better term, where we bring nature back into the equation and, and the human plays, plays a role, uh, again. And as far as, uh, and, and perhaps as integration provides opportunity. And I think I want to go back to your question about, about contextualizing what we do, um, I'm, I'm a scientist, um, and I do uh, and I do research. I'm a I'm a physicist uh, that I'm an engineer and then and then a physicist, and I work with materials. And I believe that materials hold a lot of a lot of uh, solutions for us. And these materials are hidden in nature, and a lot of these uh, these things uh, these things that uh, these things that might help along and ultimately impact us uh, are are sitting all around us, and I think that, uh, and I think that we can elaborate on that uh, a little bit if you want. If you, please tell them also what you do. Uh, Pio, you know, yes, picking up on Pio, if you can go what uh, Fio has just said about about materials, talk us through a little bit, a little bit about uh, your work in Namibia in particular. Um, I started about four years ago something new at Namibia University of Science and Technology. They say, uh, can you be a professor with us? I am mostly a designer. I'm, I don't have academic qualifications. Um, so I said, actually not. You don't need another professor. But I would like to establish a center of multi multidisciplinary applied research. And the question is, apply to what? Apply to solve Namibian wicked problems. So we, at uh, the Innovation Design Lab, are not specialists. We are eclectic generalists in which we cross the disciplinary of the, of the discipline and we make project, we don't make discipline-related uh, research. Example, the first one was a solar taxi designed by Nabibian for Nabibian. So it was contrary to everything that we learned from the, the, the industry. The taxi must be super light instead of super heavy. Must be super simple so that they can make it. And guess what? Cannot be driverless uh, because then we take off the work from 10,000 people in Namibia. That would be unthinkable. 
but we can learn from the driverless to make the Namibian car driving more secure. Namibia has the unfortunate record of having the highest mortal rate of accident in the world. So this is an example. Um, and the other example is that we don't work with material, we work with students. The students are our material. And if we do a project, let's say I'm doing a desalination project with green chemistry, and we fail, okay but I had two students, then maybe the next time will be the technologists, the African researchers that we need. So, uh, so for me, contextualizing means how we can find solutions that are relevant there. Relevant there, there is nothing like this beautiful uh, theater. Um, a telephone can be a matter of life and death. People live in teen house, and they, uh, they don't, they don't, there is no eating. You know, if you come to see my students, they're all thin because they don't eat enough. You know, so, so for me is, uh, yeah, I, we can make, we are doing a solar steel desalinator. We have two patents. Can we make it in Namibia for Namibia? So contextualizing means uh, instead of changing material, changing culture. That, that's what we do. One, one question that uh, just at this point uh, in, your, in your presentation about how you work is how difficult is it to work in the environment you work in, in Namibia and perhaps in other countries, given the restrictions of old structures, of old modes of governance? Yeah. Is, how difficult is that? Because few you mentioned earlier the transition between old and new and I think now everyone r recognizes the fact that we have to think about new ways of, of approaching these problems and yet we're still functioning in very much within old structures how difficult has it been for you yeah. well think that Namibia won a, a war of independence against apartheid about 20 to, in, in 95 so not so long ago and so they won the, the war for independence but the war for democracy has not really started. So if you come in Namibia, which is a, a place like, uh, let's say, like Germany and France together, there are two million people. In Namibia, you experience the fact that you go 30 kilometers outside Windhoek, the capital, and you can see the Milky Way in colors. You know. So there is a, the presence of nature there is, is very big. And the other one is that the material. Um, students come to our university have a very poor knowledge of mathematics, of, of English. So we have, what we do then? We, we send back to high school? No, we have to work with that. So, um, so our challenges is uh, that we don't have money for equipment. You know? So even uh, when I want to, to bend uh, a piece of steel, I have to go around in different laboratories and ask for uh, something like that. So things are very slow. A lot of students are working, so they can study in the night so, um, or research. So the Innovation Design Lab is the only place at the university where we are uh, um, open 100%. So I have some security so that the student can come day and night. So. Um, I think that's enough, you get the picture. Fio, can you talk to us a little bit about your work in the context of the shifts between old and new and whether or not this represents particular problems for you? Or, and, and do you have cause to be optimistic about the changes between old structures, old modes of thinking, and new ones? I, I'm, I'm an optimist curmudgeon, right. so, um, so I'm very critical, but that does not mean that I'm, that, that I'm an optimist. Um, I work in Boston. We don't see the Milky Way, um, except on a computer screen. Uh, we maybe see the lights of Fenway Park. Um, and uh, I work on a very old material. Our lab works on a very, very old material. We work with silk. And um, so the first relationship that I see with old and new is really that nature has solved one very important problem of material strength. Um, 5,000 years ago. And what we do is really we take, uh, we take the starting point that is basically worm spit. Uh, it's the liquid in the gut of a worm and we make 
plastics, um, electronics that melt, sensors, uh, interactive surfaces, uh, new orthopedic compounds, filters for water, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's very surprising, actually, the relationship between old and new that you have when you connect a lot of the dots and you see what exists in nature and how you can reimagine it in a modern context. And it's very important uh, because generally, I think, you know, the, the, the feeling, at least that I have, is that nature is very good at building things. And so uh, nature has solved a lot of the problems that we attempt to solve today in very efficient fashion. Uh, and then the second thing is that uh, you are automatically um, bringing back traditional, traditional skills and reinventing them in a modern context. So having this old material that has been around for 5,000 years and, and, you know, and, and, doing, and doing a new set of, uh, of electronics is certainly marvelous. But the fact that, for example, you are making sensors or you're making food stabilizers with technologies that have existed 100 years ago and whose artisans are unemployed today means that there is an opportunity to take some of the things that have existed in society and that have been somewhat forgotten or are causing anxiety in, in employment because of industrialization, Industry 4.0 and what have you, and then rebring them in a modern context through the materials that we use. And so, and so this is probably what, uh, what uh, why my connection between the old and the new is that these materials really operate at the interface of the past and of, the, and of, of what might be uh, an application of the future. It certainly brings together, it certainly brings together um, bottom up and top down because we use modern transformation to modify the materials that are assembled and they grow, nature grows things and machines usually reshape it and transform it. And so we like to operate at this interface between bottom up and, uh, and top down. And then the consequence is that our lab that has probably um, a, number, a number of people is very anti-disciplinary. I'm not going to call it multidisciplinary. It's, uh, it's a bunch of people that want to do something that has a tangible impact and, and it really embeds a lot, of, uh, a lot of folks from certainly the sciences, but we have artists in residence, musicians, architects, um, writers, and, and so forth that populate this, uh, this, this environment and are very seamlessly connected. Yeah. Well, that, <clears throat> what that seems to suggest to me is that actually what you're engaged in is a reconfiguration of of trying to sort of um, assemble the knowledge that we already know, that we already possess, but we just don't realize that we have it. And we're trying to think about new ways to put it together. Because um, there's a lot of talk nowadays about how much we don't know. And it's presumed to be how much we don't know technologically. Mm. But actually, we do already possess a lot of knowledge about how to live with nature. But perhaps it's, it's a more traditional way of thinking that has been pushed aside. Um, and that's something I'm, I'm interested to, to, to think about, just, and, and we'll come back to this in a second, but Pure, you mentioned earlier um, the ability of the Namibian people to survive in conditions that are very hostile, climactically, that, for example, people in Europe are very afraid of. And the, the, uh, the existence of, the, of Namib Namibians suggests that actually we already know how to deal with those conditions. Um, um, I think this is the problem of how you fight the colonialist mind that is in us European when we go to Africa. And there is, for example, in Namibia, there is the oldest desert in the world, the Kalahari Desert. And then there is one of the oldest population, apparently some DNA genetics, we are all coming from a small tribe from Africa. We could say we are all African, even our skin are more <laughs> Uh, light fair, uh, and there is a population that is called the sound populations. And when you see this population, they in their fissure, you can see they are very dry, they are like plums, you know, dried plums. And they have managed to survive in one of the worst environments in the world. How much we could learn from that, you know. So, um, again, for me, um, it's very important the cultural transfer that we do. Uh, for example, we are doing um, a, a water depurator 
in which we are using indigenous knowledge is called the Moringa seed. The Moringa seed is a plant that is all over the world. In, in Southeast Asia, they call it the miracle plant. And we discovered, they discovered, that when you crush the seed, this is a flocculating capability, so it is able to uh, um, catch anion and cations, and then the, the seed, the, the, the particle becomes so big, then falls down. So it can depurate water. So we are trying to learn from them and apply it in, 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 in a different matter. Um, so there was a question, are we optimistic? Um, I, I don't know. I really, I cannot really answer this question. The only things that I can do, I keep doing it. Uh, there are many reasons for not being optimistic. You know, this anti-science uh, um, way. You know, you, you look at this uh, figure like Trump. You know, or Brexit, or uh, you know. Um, so there is a wave that seems to me we are in a turning point. And the turning point is make alliances with people of goodwill, and let's do it. And so I don't believe in a unified grand theory of social transformation. I think that is, our society is too complex to have a unified grand theory. So more humbly, what I do, I work on individual scale. I work one student at a time. And what will happen will happen. So I don't have... A, the power of a structure that you have feel. But I have the power of my students. And I, I work with them. When my students apply to work at the Innovation Design Lab, they say, for what field of specialization? I don't give a damn what field of specialization. Come and work with me, but you have to promise one thing. It's a character thing. Are you willing to cross the boundary of the little that we know? When we start to do the, the, the car, I never built a car. Actually, I'm a very poor mechanic. But I say to them, you know, let's do it together. And when we will know, we will learn. So, Pew, you're talking about the, the, the specifics of, doing, of taking baby steps, as you were, you were talking about earlier, but actually applying it to, to very you know, con concrete ex examples. Pew, do you, what about this, this question of grand theory? Well, so I, I agree. With, with, with doing with, with context and, and the context and the context is ever is ever varying. Well, the the, the grand theory is um, grand theories are if they are motivated by aesthetically beautiful questions and if they are really about the essence of knowledge, the grand theories are absolutely worth pursuing. Grand theory for grand theory's sake, to say that you have a global solution, I'm a little bit skeptical. I'm not optimistic about right. those types of grand, of, of grand theories. Um, I think, you know, in, in the, to, to, to build on what you were saying, Pio, um, I think that one of the important things with, with the other side of our living materials, which are the students, in fact, um, is that it's very, it's very uh, nice to, uh, to be anti-disciplinary by design and, and sort of have this combination of context, both from a, um, I guess, from an awareness of, uh, of what tools are needed, from an awareness of what problem you're trying to solve, and from, for the awareness of, uh, of what you have to deal with in order to solve it, which means that if you're dealing with a problem in Namibia, then you have certain boundary conditions that are very realistic and impose a set of solutions that you may not have in Boston. And this applies to everything, and it is probably one of the most valuable lessons to learn for for the students that are there, there is to be able to apply to apply things in meaningful ways and realistically. And I think that in in terms of the capacity to connect and the ability to execute, I'm I'm an, I'm an optimist. In terms of uh, the propagation of these things, uh, it depends. And so the, that's I'm not sure I'm not sure what is going to happen. Um, Both of you work sort of across borders, so in, in numerous regions, um, and you've seen your work applied in lots of different contexts. 
Could you talk a little bit about something that we, we've started to discuss you know, privately about how these solutions can be applied equally across the world? So I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of uh, do they have the same application in the context of a rich country in the global north, for example, as they do in the global south? That's a good question. I, um, I actually think we do. Because uh, in a situation of scarcity, like in Namibia, we are going more and more towards the situation of scarcity in America, when the, the amount of poor are increasing dramatically. So we can adapt some solutions and, uh, to find affordable solutions also for, for, for the countries. There is one common bedside that it's uh, shared in Namibia, like in the other world, and is uh, the, uh, the, the poor or the, uh, yeah, I would say the totally poor um, misunderstanding of what is a reality for our leaders. And when you talk about them, uh, with them, um, they say, oh, um, there is uh, exponential growth. There is infinite growth. This is bullshit. The only things that I know is infinite growth or no, exponential growth is cancer. So, um, so we are fighting also with common sense misunderstandings that in this moment are adopted by a great number of, uh, of our political leaders who have no, uh, no, no scientific approach to what they are deciding. The reality is too complex for them. So I believe that in my case, instead of having a unified grand theory, I would like to have 100,000 or 1,000 or 500 pilot projects in different parts of the world, and we network with each other and we learn from each other. I was talking this morning with Theo on the car that we are developing. We did not have the money to make the aluminum sheet uh, skin. So what I did, that I did with textile. And he's developing a, a sensor in which if we put the, the, the sensor to the textile, we will know what is the pollution. This is what I'm thinking about. And, and if I may add before, sure. before yeah, you absolutely. Question, so, so this is part of what I was trying to say about, about ancient crafts. If you think about the textile industry, if you think about the textile industry, in, well, in Europe, or you think about the textile in industry in, the, in the Western Massachusetts in the United States, it's become non-existent, and, it's, uh, and, and all of it has been depressed. And this is, uh, and it's a tremendous technological base that exists, that has existed for a number of years that could be repurposed very easily by changing the context of what you use. And so you are redefining manufacturing, you are reinventing, I mean, sort of reinventing the wheel, but with a little bit of astuteness. And it's not only about sensing, it's the fact that you can do, you can do uh, solid parts. You can use textiles to do the same things that you do with carbon fiber. They might not go on a Ferrari, but they might be in the interior of a Ferrari if you have a good designer. So, um, so there's a lot of these things that I think are very, are very important in the, at the nexus of these, uh, of these right. things as well. Thank you. We have a large number of questions that have suddenly come through on the, on the iPad. So I think we should try and take a, a few of them. Um, we as society are responsible for bringing this gap between humans and nature. We're moving so much away from nature every day, starting from schools, homes, working spaces. We have no idea what nature gives us because we do not have any contact with nature. How can we change this and what would be the steps? I, I, I could go on about this for many, many, many hours. Um, Give us a, a, a small summary. I, so I think that you try, so, so there is one thing I think that is very true is, is that the most profound technologies, the, the technologies that have the most impact uh, are technologies that are forgotten and that you take for granted. And nature probably we have taken for granted for a long time and we stop to appreciate, to marvel at the things that are around us. Um, I don't know if you can relate, but think about how many times you still, you're still amazed that you're sitting in an airplane these days and that you're actually in the middle of the sky on something metallic that weighs a ton. It's, it's very commonplace. And I think that the reintroduction, the reintroduction of, of 
bio-inspired or nature as a designer back into technology is one way, one way to get closer. And it's also, a, it's also sort of like a, a magic trick. It's a misdirection where you, take, uh, where you take a technological application, but in order to get it to fruition, then you have to plant more mulberry trees or you have to, or you have to populate a field or you have to generate more that actually puts you in contact. And this applies to food chain supplies, to, to agriculture, and how you do ag tech and, and food preservation, et cetera, et cetera. So. Pio, what's your view on that? Um, how do we bring Cubans closer to... I, I think love. It's very simple. Love. Uh, um, and I'll make an example. How I love nature, because when I was a three-year-old, an old man who had no son, he taught me how to swim. At five years, my, grand, uh, my uncle, that was substituting my absent father, gave me a little uh, mask, and I could go underwater, and I discovered the wonder of underwater. I exploited that, because I used to be a diver in the night and sell the fish to the, the restaurant in the morning so that I could pay my university. But I loved, I loved nature. And nature, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough teacher, you know? If you make a mistake, you die. But if you don't, you, you, you will survive in a better world. I, I believe that um, um, if we reestablish a link of love, instead of a link of exploitation with nature, we can go a, a long way f far. Right now, we are not doing that. So. Another question that has come through, are you optimistic that humans will be able to reverse the catastrophic effects of climate change in the next 11 years? You go first. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not optimistic. Uh, we are too slow and we are not taking care of a, a fundamental um, equation that was written by Newton you know, a few 500 years ago, that is the law of inertia. The mechanism that we have put in place uh, have their own inertia, their no vested interest, they will continue to go forward for a while. And I think that we will face deeper crisis, and uh, since we are stupid human beings, we react to crisis, but then we forget. So um, I am not optimistic. If you I wish I would. If you were talking about reversal rather than stopping. Uh, um, I can't. I can't avoid being optimistic, but I'm optimistic, a little optimistic, but I'm, I'm very scared um, because something needs to happen. It needs to happen soon and it needs to be thought out. And I think the barriers are high and, uh, and people are really trying. Uh, I don't know, I don't know the, I, I really am scared about the scale of intervention that might be needed and how quickly it might be needed. And there's a very, very furious debate that is going on about, uh, about this. Some people, some people think that we can adapt. About time scales, you mean? Oh, about time scales. I think that, yes, I mean, the, the famous example is that, you know, if you light a match, then you can extinguish it. But if you boil a pot of water, it's gonna take a long time for the pot of water to cool right. down, and this is what's, what's happening. And so if we are continuing to keep you know, to keep the stove on uh, underneath, underneath our bodies of water, then you might get a point where, where then it's, you, you don't even know what to do and the solutions become drastic. One question, which is, I think is very pertinent to both of you because it, it's sort of about design. How can we educate young designers that resources are content defined and not infinite and how can we impose sustainability? Um, well, I think again it's about context and it's about dialogue. In a way, I was going to say that it's about it's about love of what you do. If you this, this ties into I'm just going to interrupt slightly. Yeah. This ties in with another question about yeah. this issue of sustainability and the ways it's managed, in which it's manageable, or if it's manageable. Uh, to everyone, regardless of their financial background. What are your views on that? Um, so everybody has a story of some famous guy that they met and they, or some famous, famous woman that they've met and that, in my case, and that asks you a tough question. 
and when you try to describe you know what you do and the tough question is why why should I care and I think that uh, I think that if you keep that in mind it informs really your the way that you ask the question and it informs your sense of aesthetics it informs the sense of of permanence of context of impact of how this object is going to fit in the grand scheme of things and it could be just something beautiful that inspires or something very practical that helps but if it's driven by the right question i think that that that's where it comes together and if it comes together and your and the impact is something that has to be integrated in the world that we live in uh, it might be sustainable within the question itself and so the other thing that you can do is you can you can win by guilt I'm sorry if I'm taking just a little bit too long but you can also point out facts that people don't think about and so the facts are that any white t-shirt that you that you are wearing that you're wearing today has consumed two years of drinking water so uh, so that's uh, so think about all the clothes that are in your closet and I say this with absolute uh, self irony um, looking at what I'm wearing so Pio, what yeah. are your views on sustainability? How, how do we maintain that? How do well, we manage it? I, I think a sustainability cannot be practiced outside you, your own. If you are not able to make your life better, eat less meat because one kilo of meat needs 50,000 liters of water, then you, 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 we pay lip service to sustainability. So how we do with my students? With my students, is they, they come with an idea, okay, good, let's prototype them. So action learning, I use action learning because if we prototype, then we learn how to do it and how to improve it. This is one thing. The other thing is uh, that when the student says, oh, I have a problem, I say, fantastic. Then come tomorrow with two, three solutions. They come tomorrow with three solutions, they say, okay, come with other two solutions. So you don't provide the solution, you provide the means to find the solution. And the third one is beauty. I, I, being an Italian uh, of the southern Italy, um, beauty is very important to me. So, please. Just, in, just because there was an element in the last question about uh, differing financial backgrounds. So this idea of beauty, is, I mean, and, and the way beauty impacts, you, as you believe, uh, the question of sustainability, does that apply to all societies across the world? It does, it does. And also, if you want, sustainability, oh, sorry, sustainability is not, be um, sorry, the lack of sustainability, it's ugly. You know, we, we create mountains of plastic that go in the ocean, 97 or 95 percent of the plastic, we don't have control. And we, we are now starting to eat microplastic through the fishes. How horrible is that? So I, I think a sustainability with sense of beauty would be easier to practice. It's easy? No but it's worthwhile doing it. How, how might that, how, can you offer us, just before we finish, a vision, your vision of how this might, might play out in the next sort of 10 or 20 years? I, I believe that uh, there was a lady there, I don't see her, well, they talk about art. I think art is a very important lesson to teach us. Art is unencumbered by the power. Art is done because you need to do it, not because somebody will buy. You need to do that. And I think if we are inspired by the generosity of art, I think we, 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 might, we might have a solution. Um, uh, I work on small scale. Uh, I work on one-to-one on -one or few-to-ones. And so I, I, I will keep doing that. Theo, any final thoughts on sustainability well uh, it's it's very biased but i think but i think if we look at the way that nature builds and nature performs nature inherently has a very sustainable redundant uh self-healing uh integrated cycle and that's that's what better inspiration to to tech to for technology to follow Thank you very much. This has been a fascinating and just the start of a very, there are a lot of questions I'm afraid we could not take uh, that really you know, build on everything we've talked about. So perhaps you know, there'll be occasions uh, later on this afternoon to speak individually. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you.
Before we go on, and in case you haven't noticed, outside in the lobby of uh, the Opera House, you can see a number of items generated by Fio Menetos City Club in, in Boston. There are a set of tapestries, t-shirts, and prints that are made of environmentally reactive material. This is basically liquid ink that is constantly in the process of reacting and interacting with the environment around it and changes color as it does so. So I would encourage you, it's, it's really uh, a fascinating material to look at and I would encourage you to take the time and take a look when you can later. Thank you. Although how the public engages with art and culture has changed significantly in our digital age, museums as physical spaces continue to be the main way we choose to interact with our civilizational heritage. The Stavros Niarchos Foundation's long-standing and expansive support of museums worldwide includes established institutions, but also new ones, that aim to narrate the experience and history of previously marginalized communities. Welcome. The five of us are all that's standing between you and lunch. Um, this, we've got a distinguished group of artists uh, here, and what we're discussing is the society of the spectacle, the idea that somehow real life, our living relationships with one another, have been over the course of the last couple of generations displaced by technology, by image, by spectacle. It's a very broad subject, and I've asked each of our panelists to be ready to talk for just a couple of minutes, I thought, to introduce their reflections on the theme and perhaps some of the ways that their own practice tries to engage with this theme. So it is my great honor to ask William Kentridge if you'd be willing to begin. Uh, thank you. To talk a bit about the absorption by the spectacular, it's clear that there are forms of image which are completely seductive to us today. So when you've been properly enveloped in a virtual reality headset, 
there is always something disappointing about taking the headset off and finding, oh, you're just back on the stage out of this extraordinary world that you've been projected in. And I'm sure there will be people who will live in this virtual reality world. If you've got a dull life and a dull place to live and a job, if you put on your set, you, the headset, you are transported into an extraordinary world. And I'm sure there will be some people who will be swallowed by that, but I cannot imagine that that's going to be the shape, the entire shape of our future. In the same way when microwave oven came about, people first said, oh, well, that's the end of the kitchen. This new technology will take over. And we find it has a good small niche use, but it's not the center of what we do. And I'm obviously, as an artist working in a studio in Johannesburg, much more interested in the physical, in what is it that we get from watching and being part of the physical activity of making. And sometimes that physical activity is seen inside a digital world. But for me, it has to do with the physicality of material, with the movement of the human body in making art, all the things that are kind of absent when you're looking at a screen-based object. And I think that's the direction I would take in this. Uh, what is it to think in the body and to think in material? I also think there are very interesting things that come back to the myriad of solutions rather than a grand solution suggested in the previous talk. There's an interesting proverb from Botswana, because we've been in the southern part of Africa with the stories of Namibia, and this is next door to Namibia, Botswana. And it's a touchstone for me in thinking about both artistic practice and about larger questions. And that is the African proverb that when the good doctor can't cure you, find the less good doctor. And maybe we'll get back. We have a, the practice I have is a, one of the practices is a small art center called the Center for the Less Good Idea. <laughs> and there are things in that that relate to the question of how we relate to these huge processes around us. That's extraordinary. Thank you. Bill. Uh, yes. Um, let me see. I. I just had a moment of inspiration while listening to the last, and I want to read you something. And it will be um, a favorite poem of mine by um, Frank O'Hara, uh, some call him the beat poet. And it is, uh, let us do something grand just this once. Something small and important and un-American. Some fine thing will resemble a human hand and really be merely a thing. Not needing a military band nor an elegant forthcoming to tease spotlights or a hand from the public's thinking, but be in a defiant land of its own, a real right thing, a real right thing. So I'm very much with my colleague here. Um, I usually, in, in, in situations like this, when the atmosphere is so incredibly uh, thoughtful and intellectual, I feel the animal of uh, the performer in me. And that's the only response I can really give to some of the questions that we're uh, dealing with. Uh, in my experience, many performers and makers are extremely self-involved. It seems to be part of the uh, job description. Mm. We're not saints. Most of us are not scientists. And we are uh, battling demons. Uh, some of them are self-generated. Some of them are historical. But we have to find a way to get out there. Like, literally, my body changes when I'm on this stage with you all out there. There's a chemical change. Now, how does that save this fucking world? Mm. 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 And there's the rub. And I hope to find out something here today because I've almost given up the idea that what I do can do anything more than create these little eddies of meaning, little eddies of authenticity. Mm. And the authenticity will encourage the young. Will it attract the dollars? Now that seems to be part of the formula. So I have a theater which is called New York Live Arts. We got rid of, we don't call it dance. What people do there is embodied investigation. Reading this uh, very peculiar book that we were assigned to read, uh, Mr. Guy Dubord's um, 
uh, uh, treatise on, I believe, socialism, and he's condemning constantly this spectacle that the society has become. Now I understand why I, as a young artist, was constantly um, angry and protesting. And now how I see so many young artists right now who have no market share. There's no value on what they do. And I thought for some time that they were being very, um, I call them refugees from the middle classes. Uh, that they really were indulging in something that really nobody cared and that they were indulging in something that had no value. But you know, now I think that that posture of outsiderness is what we're talking about today. Um, thank you for having me. That was beautiful, Mel. Thank you. Noah. Following two artists is always a difficult endeavor. Well, Following yeah, two I should great... say, Noam is, is actually kind of a ringer here because he's a genuine intellectual. He's a smart guy. <laughs> and so we had to have one on the panel. Noam. Th thank you for upping that ante even further. <laughs> the, um, my role here is, I guess, as the historian theorist. And I, I'd make two interventions, if I can. One, uh, regarding Guy Debord and the Society of Spectacle, and William, your example of virtual reality is apt. In the famous cover of the book, it's, uh, it's a photograph of the audience, so it's our view of you. Uh, it's a photograph of the audience wearing 3D glasses at the first 3D screening in the 50s. And so that idea that spectacle and VR, virtual reality, would somehow coincide is very much built into Debord's theory. Uh, Oftentimes, de Boer's theory of the society of spectacle is described in terms of our relationship to images. But he insists that it's not our relationship to images. Rather, spectacle is the relationship between people mediated by images. So it's person to person mediated by images. Um, the, uh, the, the distinction between reality and representation then is one that I think is no longer quite tenuous. Uh, all of us, with this giant screen behind us, with the various cameras in the room, with all of our f iPhones and various devices texting questions in, uh, the distinction between reality and representation is no longer an operative one. If you lived a day without looking at any representation, it would be a strange day. It would be an awkward, almost inhuman day. The second point I want to make, then, is the relationship between humans and technology. And oftentimes, technology is seen as the antithesis of the human. The technological and the human are somehow at odds, and uh, technology is encroaching on our humanity and taking over. Again, I want to posit more or less the opposite, and there's a rich philosophical tradition here as well. Uh, what distinguishes us as, as human beings compared to most other beings on this planet is precisely technology. And this audience hardly needs a reminding that techne is the root for technology, but it's also the root for the arts. Um, one of the key technologies of the human being is writing. Writing is a technology, it's a technique that makes us human. Uh, the French sociologist, anthropologist, in 1935, uh, Marcel Mousse, in 1935, wrote this incredible essay called Techniques of the Body. He says, every culture uh, institutes its own body techniques. So it's not just dance, which is certainly, you know, and we all recognize the incredible technique required to do the dance that you do. Um, it's also how we defecate, how we fornicate, how we walk. Um, these are also techniques oftentimes shaped by our technologies. So. I would say to be human isn't to find a space outside of technology, but rather to negotiate our relationship with techne, with technology and with art. I, I think we can safely agree that Noam just hit it out of the park as the smart guy on the panel. That's beautifully spoken. Um, Yuri. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, um, I thought that uh, society or spectacle representation as reality is, is a, real, a really very topical chosen title because um, we've been listening this morning to a lot of talk on the internet, on technique, on, on the technical um, and now we're talking about um, representation um, 
and maybe theater as representation of reality. And I think there's something crucial at this moment happening in the arts and especially in the theater, theatrical art. And that's the strange thing that originally theater was representation of a reality which was not there. It was representation of a reality which was um, uh, outside the theater. But suddenly, because of the internet and of the amazing fact that the most part of the world population is touching glass all the time. How many of you at this moment is touching glass? Just raise your hands. How many of you are touching glass at this moment? Or were touching glass in the last five minutes? So, um, you know, everybody here is for a big part of the day in contact with something they think reality is, but it's not. It's silicon, it's glass. So imagine, you know, that we are standing half of the time, everybody is standing half of the time with their fingers to the, to the, to the window. We're touching nothing, we're touching glass. So we're detached from reality. And if you're detached from reality, you can get psychotic. Because what does a psychotic do? He cuts himself because he wants to feel reality. And what does the theater become? It has become one of the only places, the free spaces, the free places, to have real reality. Where bodies, human bodies, are on stage performing something which is interactive between people, between bodies. So, representation as reality, the theater, the place for performance has become one of the few places where we human beings encounter the unexpected, encounter something which, is, which might uh, be different than we thought, which is cooked for you live while you are present. It's fresh, it's good for you, it's healthy. I mean, go to a good restaurant and have fresh ingredients be cooked for you while you're present. It's wonderful to see a cook work. It's contact with reality, and that's what we do. That's what we actually, at this moment, are doing. We're cooking up something. We're, we're um, um, uh, um, um, uh, breathing hot air. It's the same as a cook does. You know, he's making hot air, then he's cooking something. And that's what we're doing. And that's why, I mean, your question is really wonderful, if, uh, Bill, if I, if I may. You, you're saying, I hope that it just, you know, what the fuck does it make a difference to make the world better? And I think, especially now, especially now, while all humanity is turning to glass, uh, it becomes one of the most important places and free spaces for a real art, for something of a real humanistic art, where the body, the presence of the human body, and remember, all the technical things, the techne, everything comes out of the human body. All we know, all we see, everything in the world we know, so a place where we can get together and see each other and see each other into the eye is incredibly important. Actually, it becomes the countervailing power to the algorithms which dictate our behavior and our future. So I think um, <laughs> it's a wonderful question. And I, um, I'm conducting a small theater or thinking space or free space uh, at the Leidseplein in Amsterdam. And I think I brought you several slides to um, to, um, and I like to walk through them. For instance, this is the sort of performances we try to do. Nationalism c'est la guerre, it's a, a quote from François Mitterrand when he had his goodbye speech at the European Parliament, and he said to the parliamentarians there, and the last sentence he says is, remember, le nationalisme c'est la guerre. And we did a big performance and we asked our Minister of Culture, which is the woman here standing with some, some famous Dutch actors, um, we did all text on nationalism and uh, asked her to read out our national declaration of independence, the Plakkaat van Verlatingen, which is a 17th century text, and she read it out. And um, it, so we, we tried to do these sort of performances where um, we, have a, we did a performance for, for months and months, we followed the working poor, and we had them on stage doing what they do every day, and then suddenly politicians realized that they can't manage. And um, we did something uh, with, uh, we, 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 we do these sort of performances every day, um, and it's a mixture between politics and, um, this is actually William Kentridge. 
giving a drawing lesson at the Bali uh, in front of an audience here to, uh, uh, to make us understand what it is to have contact with reality. It was a wonderful, wonderful evening. And um, we, um, this, is, this is about what I brought, brought you. But I think, I think what's important to remember for a stage performances, which are the ones we do, is that originally, um, democracy and theater have the same root, the same root here in Athens. I don't need to point that out probably to an Athens audience, but um, they have the same roots and they have been going two ways. They first, I mean, we've been thinking that theater is something which is in this sort of, sort of spaces and has nothing to do with the theater we see in our parliaments. It has this, they joined at the hip when they, when they came about, the polis with its democracy and its theater had one function. And um, I think it's important to remember that theater is a political act. It's not political theater, it is politics. It is what influences the battle of ideas. It's what influences the public. It's what influences the voter. So it is politics. It's not political theater. It is the same as politics. That's really interesting. Um, I'm going to try just a, a brief anecdote um, because I think one of the things that Society of the Spectacle refers to is not just the technology, but the way in which technology can be used to actually disguise reality and specifically to take human relations and turn them into objects, turn them into commodities, take them out of the body, if you will, into something else. And I think uh, one of the ways I can talk about that is that my theater produced a, a musical called Hamilton, um, which became uh, popular. And um, indeed, it was a musical about democracy. It was a musical about black and brown people reappropriating the founding of the United States to reassert the idea that the United States was a country of immigrants and built on immigration, and that those are the people who own the idea of the nation. It's a beautiful, um, radical idea. And of course, the show itself became a commodity that was the hardest to get ticket in New York City, and that people were paying hundreds and indeed thousands of dollars to get tickets to the show. And some of you might have heard the anecdote that shortly before his inauguration, Vice President-elect Pence came to see Hamilton on Broadway, and um, the audience booed, and he had a wonderful response. He turned to his son and said, son, that's the sound of democracy. Great. End of the show, we had Brando Victor Dixon, a wonderful actor, read from the stage a statement of ours that we rapidly put together, which was very polite, uh, but basically said, we are concerned about the policies your administration will engage in. Again, Vice President Pence was terrific. Um, his boss, the, the president, was not quite so sanguine about it, and so sent out a series of very angry tweets demanding an apology from us, whereupon an um, internet petition was created to boycott Hamilton. And within hours, it had 200,000 signatures. And I looked at it, and I went, something is wrong with this picture because none of those 200,000 people were ever going to see Hamilton. It wasn't coming to a city near them. If it was, they couldn't afford the ticket. And if they could, they didn't have the connections to get a ticket. They weren't boycotting us. We've been boycotting them for a long time. And that seems to me one of the great questions that is there for all of us as artists. Who are we reaching? not just as spectators, but as creators. Who is participating in this artistic life that I could not agree with you more is a beautiful thing, is a vital thing, is an important thing for not just the expression, but the creation of our own humanity. But who gets to have a seat at that table? Who gets to do it? Who is our art reaching? So in a way, that is the question I would love to throw out is, what are, whether optimistic as norm or pessimistic, what, what are we thinking of how do we open the doors and actually fulfill the promise of what I think this city gave us 2,500 years ago of democracy? I would love somebody to speak to that. 
for me, that is so not the question. Um, as soon as you start trying to think, what does someone else need to know? What must I show an audience? It becomes a kind of a Leninist question. What is the answer? What is, what is needed in that sense? As if you can predict what an audience out there is going to think, how they will receive it, as if you know more than them. And for me, the only way to work is to work in the studio from the inside in the hope that the work I'm making will make sense to me and the people I'm working with in the hope that if it does, other people will connect to it because there are so many strands of common vision, sets of association, and that's always the essential way that art works. It's the strength that comes, and this is what Yuri was saying about the ast astonishing thing of people gathered together, seeing a common thing and that reflecting back to them and seeing the other people next to them by the fact that both of us are watching the same performance is an enormously comforting thing to understand we're not completely on our own. And all the other things kind of flow on that. I understand there are questions about how does one enlarge the audience, how do you get it out of the one city into another. But as someone busy making things, that can't be the way, that can't be the question that I'm asking myself in the studio. For me, the studio is very, and that's a separate question, which maybe we come back to, as a demonstration of agency in the world. What it is to be making art is to show the strength we have of making sense, and that's something that is natural to the studio, whether it's a dance studio or a painting studio, and something that's very often invisible in the rest of the world. And one of the things about the spectacle is that we receive it as if it's a given out there, and rather that we are busy constructing it as we watch it. Please, Yuri. Well, um, I understand your question. You're absolutely right that there is something in our culture which has become exclusive. And there's a, it's a big problem to, to, to enter our art centers. And there's a, an idea that it's not for non-middle-class bourgeois people, whether it be, excuse my French, white trash or the children of migrants. Or, so the, those two groups don't feel that art is for them. And that's a big problem. And I think part of that problem is that a lot of artists and we who are directing art centers um, see it no longer as something which is joined at the hip with the political, with the contemporary, with the relevant, with the immediately relevant to everybody in the room. And but we see it as something which has become detached, as a nice to know, as a baroque thing, as a as as sort of an extra to society. But we, the artists, the makers, the performers, need to 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 get into our performances real questions, questions which matter to real people at this moment in time. And if we don't, then it becomes something for the middle classes as a leisure and a pleasure. And, um, and that's the end of culture, of course. So, <laughs> so that's why I'm saying theater, performance art, performances, um, the wonderful things William Kendrick does <laughs> um, are um, politics. They're not political art, they are, they are relevant to the things we do now. And places where you can think out loud on a stage with those sort of things are like a laboratory. Right. So it doesn't really matter how many people are there, but the fact that something new is created will reverberate and dissip, dis, uh, 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 dissipate, how do you yeah, say that, um, too, uh, drip down, disseminate. Yeah, disseminate into other parts of society. You know, I wonder if both you gentlemen could address uh, because I think, uh, Oscar, I wonder if, uh, because we're Americans, if we have a particular take on this, and maybe you can help us here, um, who, who pays for your work? How does it get made? Because uh, I have come from the avant-garde tradition. When we were young, we would make the work and go into debt, and we'll you know, let the devil take the hindmost. And we'll, but you know, as, you, as time goes on, particularly if you're, if you're trying to run an institution, that bottom line becomes ever more important. And then we have the thing called a board of directors. And your board of directors are volunteers. 
And uh, the irony of this book, which declares itself a Marxist tract, was, quite frankly, for those of us who will, who will be honest enough to say it, in America, you, um, no matter how left-wing your work is, you're probably depending on a, a deep-pocketed group of capitalists to pay for it. So, I hear what you're saying. The problem I have right now in my small theater is that um, black people, poor people, don't think it's for them, which is what you're saying. They don't think it's for them. And therefore, I know I'm not supposed, I, I hear what you're saying, but you know, I have to think in a way what it is that I'm doing. If I'm going to prepare a meal for vegetarians, um, I've got to think about the vegetables. I've got to think about the flavors and so on. So, uh, speak to us, educate us, or maybe you can jump in here as well. The business of the art. With the Center for the Less Good Idea, we've consciously kept it small enough that we don't have a board of direct, we don't have a board of directors, we don't have a, uh, we don't have to write proposals. The principle is that we invite different artists, musicians, filmmakers, poets to come together in the small center, which is three small rooms in Johannesburg, and discover the energy that comes from working together. And generally in South Africa, and I'm sure in many places, you have to show a demonstrable social good to get grants of money. You've got to show it's going to reduce the number of AIDS cases in the country, or it's going to uh, increase literacy, all the pressing questions in the country, but which exist and for which there are many institutions dealing with it. But for us, it seemed vital to show the possibilities of what can be made with the collaboration of people across fields, when there's a different kind of logic in operation, and that is the logic of what arises through peripheral thinking from the margins. After you've had your good idea, what are all the things that actually emerge in the process of, of making? And one of the costs of that is that we keep it a very small scale, and it's a demonstration, it's a kind of an exemplar of how thinking can happen and how making sense of the world can happen. And most of the projects that are done are very politically based because the artists coming are very interested in what's happening. How, in how do the actors get paid? Um, they get paid through, I mean, at the moment it works that I allocate a certain amount of money each year and that's the budget for it. And that's why we keep it a small scale. And it's not the, it's not the scale of costs that you would have in uh, American... Mm -hmm. See, something SMA. happened in the U.S. because... Uh, I was speaking in the national, I was working at National Theater some years ago, and they talked about uh, war, war Horse. Remember that? And they said that it was a labor of love for a group of talented people who worked together. And then something happened when Steven Spielberg came wanting to option it for a, fa a film. People stopped speaking to each other. People wanted a piece of the pie. Something happened in Eden. Uh, you, you're drawing a picture of Eden. Right? And, and I don't know if that, in, a, in the U.S., everybody right now from the, the first year graduate out of college is thinking about my loans, my rent, and pe the generosity of spirit is no longer there as it used to be. Let's get together and just see what we can do. Um, I, I'm, and I, I think there is a perverse moment right now, but this is a reality of this uh, society of spectacle right now. Bob Wilson, uh, the director of Bob Wilson, Robert Wilson, tells a, a great story. He, uh, after bringing Einstein on the beach up to the Met, um, he uh, told his dad about it, and his dad, who wasn't all that accepting of him generally, and he said, uh, you, tells him all about it, and, and his dad asks him, so how much money did you make? And he says, well, we brought in uh, $800,000. He goes, ooh, that's impressive. He goes, but it cost us a million dollars to make. And he says, Bobby, I'm proud of you. I never thought you were smart enough to lose $200,000. <laughs> so the, This is a legend in our world. <laughs> the, I, the question has to be, and I've, I've, uh, I, I enjoy the Met very much, and I've seen a number of Williams productions and looking forward to the next one. And when I was a, you know, in college, I would you know, sit up all the way at the top and you know, in the sky, in the heavens, and today I pay $200 or whatever it is for a seat to actually get a proper view of the production. Um, and the reality is I look around and everyone basically is white, 
everyone is older. Um, that is to, to an astonishing degree. Um, so basically this is art in the service of rich white people, older white people. Um, and one has to ask, so is that it? Is that the end of the story? And I think, um, for me, part of the equation has to be, and I'm looking at the cameras, and I'm looking at the photographers, and all the documentation that will take place here, and I'm sure this is being live streamed someplace and will be archived and made available. Much of the work that I've seen has been on YouTube, on you know, bootleg copies of things that get circulated in the kind of gray zone of, uh, of the internet. And while no one would ever confuse a, a VHS tran digital transfer posted on YouTube of you know, a Worcester Group production from 1989 as the real thing, as that authentic experience encountering, et cetera, if we simply relegate that to the society of spectacle and dismiss that as atomized existence of each one alone in their room looking at a screen, I think we have missed a significant utopian opportunity for what technology can offer. I think that if this type of theatrical and performance arts is going to have a widespread future, it cannot be just for the $200 ahead uh, rich, white, old folks at the Met. It has to also be, and in, and, and in the states, you know, we don't have state funding for these things, so uh, you know, the price, uh, ticket prices is, is, is high. I think it has to also be that kind of cheap, uh, um, what, what the contemporary artist and theorist, Hito Steil, this wonderful uh, German contemporary artist, what she calls the poor image. The poor image that is low quality, that circulates kind of freely, almost outside of capitalist structures, that poor image, I think, is going to be, if there is salvation, and there may not be, if there is salvation, I believe the poor image will be a crucial part of it. And I wish she was here because I would say to her, poor people don't want the poor image. I'm, I'm not a poor person, but I also thrive on the poor image. That, I've no, but, seen no, but just work. for a moment, Tatlan, isn't it true that the Russian constructivists, though, back in the day, and, and they were all talking about the the, oper the work for the working people, the work for the working people. The working, working people wanted Romeo and Juliet. They wanted Giselle. They wanted the Bolshoi. They wanted ballet. They did not want your, the, the symbolic expressionist theater. Once again, we work ourselves into a corner about what they should want, right? Right, I mean, I just have to intervene quickly because all of this is a great discussion. I just want to say that I completely agree with you William, that the role of the artist can't be to, on high, colonize the others by showing them the culture they deserve. It involves an actual engagement with and dialogue with people who are not like us. And in the States, I know that is unbelievably important, not least of the reasons being that if we don't engage in that dialogue, we've discovered the revenge that those who have been excluded from our culture will take on the rest of us. So it's, it's actual almost self-preservation that we need to figure out a different way of approaching this kind of dialogue and not accept that the silos we're in are permanent. That's the point. I mean, if we as performance artists don't find audiences which are willing to listen to it and pay for it and come to it because it's need to know or uh, it gives them a catharsis, a, a moment in which they're elevated or you know, um, uh, inspired. If we cannot do that, if we cannot find these audiences, we will, the arts will be abolished. So either we find these audiences and, and the fact that in the matter the problem, I'm, I've never been there, I'm from Amsterdam, but uh, that, that everybody is uh, middle-aged and white, I mean, then they have the wrong sort of performances on. Because you have to understand, like you're saying, if you're cooking for vegetarians, it's a great example. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> if I cook, I know about what I cook or for others. So, I'm, I mean, if we put on a evening on Dutch literature by two famous Dutch writers, of Moroccan descent who talk about Dutch literature, writing Dutch, and having a mother who couldn't read or write and talk Tamazicht, the 
language of the Berber population in the northern part of Morocco. It's packed with Moroccans, packed, and supposedly they, they do not come to cultural evenings. Well, they do, if you have two writers talking about the problem of writing not in your mother tongue, but in the tongue you were taught. And, and you know, it's interesting conversation, is, and it's packed. <laughs> so, so, um, so you have to cater for audiences which are there and tell them things they want to hear, and they need to know. I they just, want to come out for. So I just think we it's, should it's acknowledge. In order to survive, it's 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 like it's like uh, um, uh, in that way. It's in the same as a supermarket. If you don't sell things that people want to want want, want to buy, you know, you're out of business. So, uh, in in a way. So it's just just to say, we should acknowledge that there are at least three points of view in the panel embodied in multiple ways with different of us: artists people who run institutions and theorists. And those are different ways of looking at this problem, which I think counts for some of what we're talking about here. I know certainly when I am agonizing about the audience, I am thinking as an artist, but I'm really driven by the responsibility I have, not so much financial, but mission-based responsibility of the institution I run. Uh, in the interest of intellectual honesty, I need to say, that the two most popular comments from the audience uh, consist of questions. Why are there no women on this panel? And I believe that's our first applause of the panel, gentlemen. And second, why are there no Greeks on this panel? So I just want to acknowledge that that's, that's coming here. Yeah. Um, can but, I ask, can please. I say my, my favorite New Yorker cartoon of all time uh, is of five men on a panel and this uh, just on a stage just like this and the the uh, the caption is the topic of tonight's panel why are there no women on this panel yeah. so the uh, this this is a potentially fatal flaw for which I think there is there is no proper response but it is good that we acknowledge it um, I have a question here there was a brief mention of the, quote, physicality of material and movement of the body while making art, end quote, and how that gets lost with art becoming more technological. Can someone speak more to what we lose and what we gain with technology-based art overstepping traditional art? This is, I think, the poor image that you were discussing, but more than that. William, please. There's a, there's a dictum in self-defense manuals, and that is to always keep on your feet, that the physical presence of your face close to the face of your attacker makes it harder for him to hit your head, to hit your face. And that when you're lying on the ground, your face is that much further away and it's easier to kick your head. It takes less of a shock to the system. And if you think that distance, how much easier it is if you're sitting in a trailer in Fort Lauderdale to bomb people 10,000 miles away whose images you only see on a TV screen in front of you. There's something of a distancing that the digital makes and gives. It both elides the difference between what it is to be playing a computer game and what it is to be blowing up real people. So I think that is a, a factor of the distance we get, which seems to be an apparent closeness in the flatness of touching glass rather than touching. There's something about physically getting your hands dirty in a studio, um, the sweat of moving in a dance studio. That, that is fundamental to, I think, how we approach other people to what it is to be at work in the world. And for me, it would be very hard to imagine being an artist sitting, I find it difficult to be talking, just sitting in the chair the whole, the whole time. Um, there is a sense of thinking in movement. The activity of walking around the studio is part of the activity of thinking, of that action of falling and stopping yourself from falling with each step is something that is jolting your, your brain and your mind. And for me, that's, that is a vital part of what it is. In the workshops that we do at the, the Center for the Less Good Idea, there's some discussion, but primarily it's thinking on your feet, in movement, seeing what ideas arrive in the, in, in the improvisations that happen between um, 
people. I'm not sure how you improvise on a screen. That may just be a product of my age. There may be some people who think as clearly with a mouse as I would either in movement or with a piece of charcoal. But Let me just ask, yeah. Bill, your art is movement. Your art is movement in space, presence in space. Can um, you talk about this uh, question yes. a little? Um, movement is a basic part of what I do, yeah. but much to the chagrin of my critics, I uh, insist that my, all of my, act, my uh, performers be able to act and sing, and we're not doing musicals. Not yet, you know, but they are contemporary dancers who are required to um, handle text and act and sing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, connect this to, um, there's a story, uh, the young uh, African choreographer was in our space oh, six, seven years ago. I, I barely knew him, but I remember one night, it was a very in, in, intense conversation. They did a very, very da low dance quotient performance weeks. And I remember um, in the question and answer later challenging him, and he said, well, you know, uh, as people of African descent or African people, everybody wants to come and see us sweat. That's what we're world famous. And they said, but they're not interested in what we're thinking. So now you work in Africa. I don't. Um, what do you think about that idea that people of color feel we're expected to add the, the funk? add this, the titillation, the body, you know, get it, get it all going, you know. And whereas, and I'm sorry, I'm the only, I'm not a woman, but I am representing gay black men up here, if that helps at all, right? Uh, I may, uh, yeah. uh, um, so, but I'm, my point is, what does it really mean? The body, the sweat, the real time, all of that, does the, does the public deserve that in an era where we're besotted with pornography, where Hollywood is one slug fest after another? They do studies, vis visceral studies about making you feel it. What does it, what's the value of more of that in live performance? Now, I'm being provocative here. I depend on it, but I still question it. Am I, in, in fact, collaborating with a system that is squeezing the life out of what is wonderful in live performance? Well, um, a performance, a happening, um, Reese, whether it's, um, it's something which brings you the unexpected. Like here, we're, you know, um, five bodies on a stage and we interact with each other and we don't exactly know what's going to happen. It's unrehearsed. So, um, more and more of our life is planned and technology in general um, has only a function if you plan, if it's measured, is it, if it's planned out, if it's... So it takes out the unexpected of the performance. And I think one of the reasons to go to a performance and be in each other's physical presence is to see and understand that in life things are unexpected, that there are things which weren't rehearsed, which were, weren't... And that's why um, I think a lot of the importance of, of stage performance is s making understandable that think unexpected things might happen and have to happen. And so technology is not really helpful for that. Of course, you can use uh, techniques like, like, like the thing I'm holding now, and, and that, that's a different thing. But um, um, I think if you read uh, Friedrich Hayek, The Road to Serve Them, um, where he, he's always against the planners, because the planners will bring the serfdom and the totalitarian society. So, um, so um, and it's the unexpected and the free which is the other thing. And the free is what's happening, the free and unexpected uh, is what's happening in a live performance, which is, you know, um, a cooked life for you. So that's, that's why I think that indeed sometimes technology is the opposite of what we are doing or what we are creating or... Noam, could you speak to that since you're the pro-technology guy on this panel? Yeah, I, I'm, it's interesting. I'm, I'm a, <laughs> not a technophile, really. I'm more of a technocritic, but I, I guess, you know, in a different crowd, I'm a technophile. The, uh, um, I, the, the, what draws me to theater, interestingly, is something quite different. I'm, I'm, technology is our reality, and I 
go to the theater primarily to, as, as a laboratory for what life deeply immersed in technology looks like. So trained actors, sometimes amateur actors, sometimes heavy technology, sometimes light technology. But the, the, in, in Holland it would be a figure like Evo van Hova. Um, to use an example that will be more familiar to everyone here, William, in your work, it may be about getting your hands dirty, but the performances that I've seen, and I've seen a good number of your incredible performances, are all highly technological. Uh, they involve incredible projection, and they oftentimes involve the confusion of what is human and what is technological, what is uh, real time, what is recorded time, what is improvised, what is scripted, all as the human and the techne fuse, that is both the art and the technology fuse, to me it is a laboratory. Your work is a striking, stunning, at times crazy making but always exhilarating laboratory for what a life deeply immersed in techne, in art and in technology looks like. And what I see on stage or in a live performance or for that matter in many of your video pieces is an opportunity for me to think through you, through your body, through your art, how to negotiate a life immersed in technology. And that to me is one of the promises of, of theater, to argue that theater is only a refuge from that is I think to miss some of the most vital elements in theater today. William, do you want to respond to that at all? That was eloquent. Uh, I mean, I think that's right. That there's very often we've worked with I mean, I started making drawings, then I started filming the drawings, they became animated films, and then we put actors in front of the animated film, so it became a drawing in sort of in four dimensions, in physical space, moving through time. But I think of them very much as drawings, in which sometimes there's a piece of charcoal, and sometimes it's a projection. But it's still the activity of drawing, and by that, by the activity of drawing, I mean the central process, which is that the activity of making the drawing is the activity of working out what the drawing is. That you're constantly in negotiation between the mark that you've made and seeing it and seeing how that shapes your imagination of what will come afterwards. And I think it's that agency of making, whatever the specific technology is used, is what I'm interested in the studio and in the center of uh, the aliveness to what's coming in from the margins, from the side, everything that's not the first good idea. And so, yes, you're right, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of video projection and musical amplification in it, but it's the process of arriving at it that feels close to what it is to be thinking on your feet, rather than planning it on a screen. I, to, to use a very specific example, one of the most striking, I mean, I love so much of your work, uh, especially important to me was uh, the, your Melies suite, where you revisit this early filmmaker, one of the pioneers of film, Georges Méliès, and you, in a sense, reproduce some of these early film tricks, uh, especially running the film in reverse. So things happen, uh, it's then played forward, but your action is backwards, so that ima amazing things happen. Uh, sheets fly, flutter down in the air, you grab them and you're able to you know, put them you know, into a neat pile. Um, and this is only possible because you've internalized, or let me take a step back, Marcel Mousse, this anthropo French anthropologist uh, writing about body techniques, describes how he came to this theory. He woke up in a hospital after World War I, and he noticed that all of the nurses, all female, were walking in a certain way, and was an unfamiliar way. So first of all, it was strange that they were all walking in this new way, and then finally he placed it. He realized they're all walking the way they walk in the American movies. The movies rewrote techniques of walking. And from here he understood, ah, walking is also a technique, it's also a technology. Um, in your case, you revisit Georges Méliès. Georges Méliès, I wrote a book on artificial darkness, and Georges Méliès is one of the key figures who bridged the world of the theater. He's a magician. Um, we'll see an incredible magician, Mark Minton, tomorrow. Uh, he's a magician, he was a stage magician, who then jumps into the world of cinema, but the two are never divorced. So the same tricks he's doing are sometimes theater tricks, they're sometimes cinema tricks. He's using the same technologized darkness to perform the same tricks. 
William, you revisit these and you've internalized in your body what the machine will require, what the cinema will, will, will require, and you produce these magnificent feats by fully internalizing what the cinema requires of your action. That, to me, is exactly the work that needs to be done. Okay, but I also think it works in reverse. So you take this book and you throw it across the stage, and it's filmed, and then when you reverse it, of course, the book comes back into my hand. But it expands. If you throw 20 books and they come back at you, you manage to somehow catch all 20 books in your hand. And what that does, it sets a whole set of meanings. So it's both about reversing time, so that's a wish fulfillment, but the other thing is it becomes a kind of a vision of perfectibility, of utopia, and of regret. Running time backwards is always about regret. If only one could take back what you'd said, if only you could do it this way. I'd, I filmed my son when he was eight like this, and I gave him pots of paint and brushes and paper and pencils, and he threw the pencils across the room and the paper across the room, and he took the pot of paint and he threw it on the wall, and then I showed him this video in reverse. And of course, he catches all the pencils, he catches the paper, the paint comes off the wall into his jar, and not a drop is spilled, and he was so unbelievably proud and elated and energized by what he had managed to do. And he said, can we do it again? I said, yes, but first we have to tidy up the studio and wash the paint off the wall. So there's a kind of a sense that the activity of copying George Méliès was about discovering what that meaning was, which was about hope, possibility, perfectibility, and that's kind of what I mean by thinking in material. The activity in that material is not to express an idea, but to discover an idea through what the material offers. That's a spectacular story, and I think exactly the right note for us to end on. And I want to thank the panel, thank all of you for being here, and welcome us to lunch. <laughs>